Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're here for the practical guide to building 2D web apps. We were sort of thinking no one was going to be here because I think the party starts at 6.30, so I'm glad at least someone is here and we don't have to talk to an empty room, so thanks. Uh, my name is Kelly Hutchins. I'm a product engineer on the ArcGIS API for JavaScript team. I'm presenting with my awesome colleague, Heather Gonzago, also product engineer on the JavaScript team. I think we've been working together for 17 18. years now, yeah. so long time. Um, so how many people here are new to the JavaScript API? So that's good. That's good. It's kind of what the session's geared towards. We're going to show you um, how to get started building an app. We're going to sort of take an app from the beginning where you set up your development environment a little bit, learn how to add a map, add some layers, symbolize the layers, add a couple of widgets, and the finished product will be um, what we think is a, is a commonly built app. So here's the quick agenda. We're going to talk briefly about setup. You know, like I mentioned earlier, adding a map, adding layers, symbolizing the layers, uh, making your map interactive, which just means working with pop-ups, right? You click on a feature on the map and some pop-up displays and shows information. The presentation information is accessible on GitHub. The URL is right there. I think we made a few updates right before, so if you download it today, you might want to go back tomorrow and get the latest and greatest version. We are going to focus on version 4.0 of the JavaScript API in this session. We did version 3.0 at user conference last year, so if you're still in the 3x world, the slides, I think, are in that same GitHub repository and the demos in version 3x of the JavaScript API. So, yeah. Yeah, take a look in there. The concepts, the general ideas are the same. A few of the technical details are different. <clears throat> Let's just take a quick look at the SDK. They've done a lot of work on it recently. I just wanted to point out a few things if you're new. Uh, hmm. Let me, uh, for some reason, I see the browser on my machine, but I do not, you guys do not see it. And now you see my dog, and still not the browser. <laughs> Let me quit PowerPoint, actually. And... Just for time's sake. Yes, okay. thank you, Heather. All right, so we're going to open up um, the SDK, and I won't talk too loud. Um, js.arcgis.com will take you to the site. Um, basically, we have the SDK for both the 3x version and also the 4x version. Um, in this particular session, we're only going to focus on 4x. Um, basically, we have it broken down into um, high-level topics, guide topics. Um, specifically working within the API, this is probably where you're going to want to focus um, if you're first getting started. And then we also have it broken down uh, based on the API reference and some sample code as well. Um, if you guys have worked with 3x in the past, um, you may notice that, at least I notice, that this is a lot more user friendly. Um, you can actually go in here, search for specific classes. Um, it'll give you every instance of the class. If it's a property somewhere, basically anytime it's referenced within the, um, the, uh, the API. Same thing goes for the sample code. Um, if I want to go ahead and take a look for, I don't know, routing. I can just do a quick search on that, brings it on up. Um, and lastly, we also have our forum posts. Um, I don't know any if you guys are probably familiar, if you're not, you've heard of it already this week, the GeoNet um, forum. It's a very, very useful site um, to get familiar with. There's a lot of really good resources out there. Um, if you want to share your code, you've got questions and so forth, go ahead in there. Um, if you don't have an account set up, do so. Kelly's always on that thing. I should be more so, but I'm... Unfortunately not, so. Um, anything else I'm missing that you wanna show? I think you're good. Okay. I'm gonna try it back. I may have Heather do the slides on her machine. 
Okay, so I'm gonna switch back to your machine and if you can bring up the PowerPoint and I'll just talk to the PowerPoint. Yep. We were having problems with PowerPoint earlier showing different modes on there and I think it's causing the problem, so. Wrong one. Sorry guys. <laughs> we'll get it eventually, it's all right. Okay, that was the next there one. There we go. Okay, did you show this doc when you showed? I did not, no. Okay, so within the developer help, there's a page that has which API version should I choose. If you're, if you're on the fence and trying to figure out if you should work with version 3X or version 4X, then you should check out this page. It has lists of the available functionality in 4X. So you can say, oh, I need to build an editing app. You can go take a look and say, okay, editing's not in. You know, the version that I want to use, I need to use 3X until editing is available. Okay, developer setup. <clears throat> we have a session tomorrow at one o'clock on Friday, so if you're still around and you want a lot more information on setting up your development environment, and choose, including choosing options for selecting an IDE, setting up various plugins, learning how to use tools like JS Hint and JS Lint, working with browser debugging tools, um, and a lot more, that's a session you should go to. Uh, okay, next. Okay, let's do a quick demo. So we'll look at starting a project from scratch. Right now I'm using um, Visual Studio Code as my IDE, so let me switch back. Here I am in Visual Studio Code, and let's say I just wanna start creating a project. So I have this folder. First thing I'm gonna do is create a new file in there called index.html. And in Visual Studio Code and many other development environments, you can use these syntactic shortcuts to easily stub out your code. So in Visual Studio Code, um, if, I, if I type an exclamation point and then hit tab, it will stub out an HTML document for me so it saves me typing all that or copy pasting it from someplace else. So now I have the stub of my HTML page. And now I'm ready to add the JavaScript API references. So to get those, I'll go to the help. And in the help on the front page, we can just copy and paste this information straight into our index.html file. So we'll put it right here in the head. And now we have a link to the main.css file and to the JavaScript version 4.3 that we're working with. So now we're all set up to start writing code. So let's create a folder that's gonna hold our JavaScript and inside that folder, let's create a file called main.js. And we'll create another folder for our CSS. And inside that, we'll create a file called main.css. This is where we'll put custom JavaScript for our application and custom CSS files or styles that we want to use in our application. So now I'm gonna go back here and use some more shortcuts. I really hate to type, so if there's an easy way to do something, I'm gonna do it. Here's another one of those shortcuts, link colon CSS, tab, and it stubs that out for me. So then I can just say uh, CSS main.css. And I can do the same thing with the script tag, script colon source tab, and then I can do main or JS main.js. All right. So now we're all set up to start writing our code. So I think I mentioned earlier, I'm lazy. I do not like typing code. Visual Studio Code also has the ability to create these shortcuts. So when you're working with the JavaScript API, you'll find that there's bits of code that you write all the time. One of them is the require statement that's needed to load the modules that you're gonna work with. So I created a shortcut for that. So if I just type req in my environment, I set this up then it will stub out the require statement. So let's look at that and see exactly what's going on in here. What I'm doing is I'm using require, I'm saying I wanna load the Esri map module and the Esri views map views module. And then I wanna list the associated arguments with them. So in my code I'm gonna work with the Esri map module via map and the map view via map view. So if you're new to the API, you might be wondering, how did I know that I needed to add Esri map? Well, you can find that out in the API reference. So if I go to Esri map, 
Here it tells me the require statement at the very top. So if I want to work with a map class, I need to require Esri map, and we have the suggested argument for it is map. So same thing with map view or any class that you need to work with. Just come to the API reference and look at the name of the module that you need to load. Okay, now let's create a new map. So I'm gonna use another shortcut for map and it stubs out all that code for me. It puts my cursor in particular places that I've predefined. Here if I wanna easily change the base map to topo, I can do that. And then I could tab through and change other values like the container, the zoom value, and the center. So if we look at this, we're creating a new map. We're saying I wanna use one of the out of the box base maps. In this case, it's called topo. Then I'm creating a new map view. I want to make sure that map view is in this particular container, view div, which I'll define in my index.html. I set that map to the view. I define the zoom level as four, and I set the center lat long where I want the map to display. So I just need to do one thing. I need to add CSS. I have another shortcut. There's our CSS. So I'm just saying I want my container to take up the full page. So we're making a full page map. Just go here and make sure we have that div. Save it and then cross my fingers and run this. And we can see we have the full page map. <clears throat> if I wanted to change the base map, maybe let's look at ocean. Is it ocean or oceans? Oceans. Refresh it. And now I'm looking at a different base map, the oceans base map, still centered at that same extent that I specified and um, still at the same zoom level. Okay, Heather, can we go back to the slide where we were? Sorry. Sorry. Oh, I guess I have to switch back to you. Getting <laughs> yeah, getting the API. Sorry, guys. Sorry, this feels really clunky with the back and forth. <clears throat> yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's a sign that we should all really just be at the party, right? <laughs> um, okay, so it shows up in this mode, so I'm really sorry, we're just going to talk about it in this mode. So the JS API resource is a GitHub repository that contains some resources that we use on the JS API team that we thought might be useful to you. So you should go check out this repo, you can find things like the JS hint file that we use on the JavaScript API team. So how many people out there already use JS hint in their app? No, okay. So if you don't use JS hint, I'll tell you what it is. Actually, I'll show you what it is. Because you should, if you're not using it, you should be using it. <clears throat> okay, so back here in Visual Studio Code. If you forget things like a semicolon at the end of your, um, your uh, function or bracket or line or whatever in JavaScript, it's a problem, it's an error. Things like JS hint will tell you that it's a problem and you don't have to wait to find out when your code's not working. So I took away my semicolon and down here at the bottom of my IDE, there's a little error warning. And it tells me two things. It tells me view is defined but never used, so that's good to know. I have a variable in my app that I've defined but I've never used it anywhere. Maybe I just haven't used it yet and it's not a problem, or maybe I have a variable I don't need and I can clean it up. And it also tells me I have a missing semicolon and it tells me the line I have it missing at. So I can add that back in, save it, and now I'm down to one error. So this is really nice, um, a nice way for you to find and fix problems in your code before you have 10,000 lines of code and 10,000 problems in your code, right? Um, let's look at the JS API resources file, that JS hint. So here's the JS API resources that we mentioned. Here's that JS hint file. There's a lot of stuff in here. It's a whole bunch of lines that are commented out. 
What this is is telling your development environment the things you care about. JS Hint can be as picky or as lax as, it, as you want it to be. For example, one of the things that you can say you don't care about is mix single quote and double quote. So sometimes you use a single quote, sometimes you use a double quote for a strain value. Some people care about it, some people don't. Um, you can define a whole bunch of other things, like identifiers in camel case, uh, if it'll require all non-global variables to be defined. There's a comment for each of these, and you can read through and figure out what standards make sense in your organization. I recommend using something like this because you can come, if you're in a group of developers, you can come up with standards that apply to all of you. You can all use the same resource file, and then your code is going to be enforced to the same standard. So you'll have similar looking code, you'll be able to read a fellow developer's code, and they'll be able to read yours more easily. The way you generally use this is I just download a copy, and you just put it in your web server root directory. Or if you want different settings for a particular project, you can put it in that project directory. So I tend to just put it in my web server root and leave it there, and it's picked up by many development environments. We'll just read that file automatically. Others require you to add a JS hint plugin. Okay. Can you go? Oh. Okay, so I showed you earlier how to add the CSS to your application. It's on the first page of the JS API help. We have more than one, um, more than one CSS file in version 4x of the JavaScript API. And I don't know, Heather, if you can click. Good, you're way ahead of me. So Heather clicked on the help topic that takes you to styling. This talks about the available style sheets. So main.css is the one you're going to use most of the time. It contains all the styling for the widgets. There's another one called view.css, which is a smaller subset. So if you just have a simple app with a map, and you just have the zoom control, scale bar, that kind of thing, you might want to use this CSS file, view.css. Finally, a third option is to include one of the themes. We have a bunch of out-of-the-box themes. They'll turn your widgets one of these colors. So if you choose light red, your app will generally have a light red color theme. So you can use one of these by including that particular style sheet. And finally, anybody out there a SAS user? CSS preprocessors, yeah? So if you use a CSS preprocessor, you can access that um, SAS file for the JavaScript API, make updates to the variable, compile it, and then use that in your application and have a custom look and feel. Okay, and we already went through these first steps, so we created a simple app, and like I mentioned earlier, the code for everything we did is available on that GitHub repository, so you can access it later. So basically, we added a reference to the JavaScript API, found the modules that we wanted to use in the API reference and included them in our app, and then wrote code that created a map and its associated view and displayed it full screen in our application. So we saw this, we saw that you could make a map, we saw that you have various base maps, we have a bunch of predefined base maps that are available out of the box, oceans, dark gray canvas, light gray canvas, topographic, National Geographic, there's some vector tile base maps and more that you can reference just with these named values. And then here's the map view, we also saw this where you specify the container, that's the DOM node where you want that map to display. You specify the associated map with that view, the zoom level, and a center point where you want the app to be centered at. Now I'm going to turn it over to Heather for layers, and we'll just hope that everything works out okay. <laughs> Is it on? Is it? Yeah, it's already on. What am You're I doing? already on. I'm all over. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, so um, I'm having the same issues that Kelly's having here, so we're just going to be patient and bear with us, please. So we have a base map, that's fine and all, but you can't really do a whole lot with just a base map, right? You guys probably have your own individual operational layers that you're working with and you wanna have added on top of your base map. So with 3X and the 4X versions, we have various layer types that you can add into, into or on top of your base map. So if we take a look here, just if you just wanna get a quick idea of just what we have to work with, if you did a search for the Esri layers um, 
package within the API reference, you'll notice here we've got a whole listing of them, CSV, elevation, and so forth. Um, we're constantly adding to this. Again, um, right now we're in four. We do not have full parity yet with 3X. Um, that is coming. But um, if so, if you see something in 3X that you do not have, um, that you don't see here in four, it will. It'll come. Yeah, is it that? Is that so? I'm getting feedback here. Okay. All right. So I'll keep that open and. Let's go in here and actually just before we go ahead in there. All right. So when working with um, layers, there's a sort of set coding pattern that you're going to be following. Um, you're going to be loading the module. So in this particular case, we are loading the Esri layers. Um, we're working with a feature layer, and then we are going to create that layer. So we instantiate a new um, feature layer class, and then we're going to set any properties. You can set these properties directly within the constructor. So this is a very basic sample, um, but we're just passing in the URL to that specific feature layer. And then lastly, we just add that to either your map or your scene. If you're not sure, um, again, we can go back to that layer reference, take a look at all the properties. If this is, um, yeah, you can go in here and all of these properties, like it says, can be set, retrieve, or listen to. You can set these directly within that constructor itself. All right. All right, so working with properties, this is a little bit different. Um, if you guys are not familiar already with how four worked, um, back with three, there was a lot of getting and setting. With four, you don't have to do that. Um, you can, like I just showed you, you can set all of this directly within the constructor itself. In addition to that, you can also, we, we, we watch for your property changes. So kind of like, you know, when you would have an event, you'd listen for something, you can watch for when, let's say, your map view zoom changes, or um, your feature layer, I don't know, your opacity changes, or whatever it may be. You can listen or watch for um, any type of property, and then based on that, you can go ahead and perform some sort of function. Um, we have an Esri Core Watch Utils. Um, we have some um, um, modules in here that will help making watching these property changes a little bit easier. I'm not going to go into the, um, a lot of detail on this, but if you guys are interested, we do have a link within our help working with properties, and it's under the guide section, and it talks a little bit more in depth about some of the things that you can do. All right, so we're just showing you a lot of slides. Let's actually show some, so, some demos. So one of the cool things, um, how this, this session actually came about was um, Kelly and I, we've always, we kind of all, we've always done a lot of the intro sessions. And for a long time, it was a lot of just fluff. You know, this is a feature layer, this is a renderer. And we, we still talk about it, but what we, were, what we were seeing was that a lot of people were like, yes, but how do you actually use it? and we want to see you're talking about it, can you show us, create, create an application for us? So a couple years ago, we started basically just creating an application from the ground up. Just nothing in there, just a straight text file, and then adding your map, layers, and symbology, and so forth. So that's kind of where we're going with these, um, these demos that we're going to be showing you. So Kelly already showed you just building your first map. So what I'm going to show you now is we're just going to add a layer to the map. All right, so I'm actually I'm adding three layers to this map. So if we go in here and just take a look at the source, it's in that main JS file. We can see here that I load the, I'm requiring the feature layer, and I'm adding these feature layers. I have three of them. So I have one uh, for some activities in Palm Springs, some restaurant locations in Palm Springs and some neighborhoods in Palm Springs. So I'm just referencing these URLs. In the constructor for the map, there's a layers property. I'm passing it in this array, okay? So and it's gonna go based upon, so this is gonna be the first one that gets added, that neighborhood, the uh, food layer one, and then the activities. You can also do it, um, we have this add many and um, add, yeah, so add many, and then there's uh, the, the, if you have multiple, 
um, layers like we're doing, we can use that method as well. All righty. One thing I wanted to show here is all I'm doing here is I have the feature layers and I'm just adding them, nothing else. So if we take a look quickly, we can see here this is, and I don't know why they think this is in Maltese, we're not going to translate. Um, you'll see here that this Palm Springs activities, I'm just, I copied that URL and I opened it up and I'm looking at here in the services directory. You can see here that all of this drawing info gets stored directly within that feature layer. And that is what you're seeing here, like for example, the tram. Okay, so all of that drawing inf information stored directly within that feature layer and is carried automatically over. Okay. Wanna add anything, Kel? No. You good? Okay. So with that being said, we add our layers, that's nice and all, but we probably want to render, we want to symbolize them a certain way. If the symbology is good directly within the feature layer, like I just showed you, you may not need to do that, but you may want to go in and override what that feature or what that rendering comes across as, and that's where setting your renders within your code comes into play. Basically, renders, like it says, it, it defines a set of symbols. So you create your symbols, and then you create your render, and you specify how you want, which symbols you want to be passed on over into this renderer. Um, it's just like it says, it's a set of rules on how these actual symbols should be used. And again, here we also have a basic coding pattern, just like we had when working with the layers. And I'll show you in, not this slide, my next demo. Um, so in this particular case, we, um, we have our renders. So I have a, I first have my symbol. So I, I am creating a simple marker symbol. I'm passing in the size, the color, the width, and the outline. And I also have a unique value render that I'm creating here. Within the unique value render, I'm passing in the symbol that I just created up here. Okay, so I have this unique value render, passing in that symbol from above. And basically all that unique value render is gonna do is it's gonna take, you're telling it, hey, I want you to render these features based upon a specific value that you have uh, set within, that's, that's within the actual layer itself, within the attribute information. One thing I want you to take note of is, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, there is, um, an outline property on this simple marker symbol. If you've worked with the API before in 3X, you would know that you'd have to go in and um, specify this outline is a simple line symbol. You would normally have to go in, require a new simple line symbol, set everything up, and then pass that in here. The cool thing with 4X is that you don't have to do this anymore. We have this thing called auto casting. So, Takes me to my next slide. Um, basically, what the auto casting does, and I'm just going to bring it up in the help because I think it makes it a little bit easier to understand. Under the guide topic, we have one for auto casting as well, and it goes into a little bit more detail. But basically, what that does is it allows you to say, I don't know, in an, a session I did earlier, we also had one where it showed the, like a web map, all right, um, and you can pass a portal item in. That portal item, you wouldn't have to set there either, just like you didn't have to set the simple line symbol for the, um, the, the, the marker that I had. All of that, it, basically it recognizes it. It says, hey, I see that you're trying to create this new, this new class, okay? I see that you have a property here that you're trying to set. That property can, is automatically recognized as, I don't think it's a word, like auto, auto castable, I guess you could say. Um, and if you're not sure whether or not you have a property that can be auto-cast, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, if you take a look, can you, do you have yours on? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Go ahead, so um, if you take a look, and I'm just looking at the simple marker symbol. Let's see here, I think color should be one, yeah. Color off of the simple marker symbol, you can see here they have this auto cast. So if you have a property that you can auto cast, you will automatically have that provided to you within the help. So you don't have to go fumbling around and trying to figure out whether or not this is 
available to you or not. And this just links back out to that, uh, that guide topic that I just showed you. So I'm gonna go ahead, show you a quick example of setting that renderer. So in this case, what I have is, I'm not bringing those activities in, we don't want it to get too busy. I have my, um, my neighborhoods. So what you see here, um, these colored blocks, that's my neighborhoods within Palm Springs. And then I have my, um, my restaurants. The way that I have these restaurants broken down is based upon mileage from the, um, a buffer radius, I'm sorry, a buffer radius from the, the, uh, the convention center. So if we take a look at the actual code, you should see here, I'm creating, let's get that bigger, creating that simple marker symbol, auto casting. So I'm creating a few marker symbols here, right? So I've got actually like five that I'm using. And then I'm passing them into this unique value render. All right, so based upon whether or not I am within half mile of the conference center, whether I'm within three quarters of a mile, there's a value that I have within this particular feature layer that's set to 0 0.5, 0 0.75, or so forth. And that is stored within the proximity field. I set that unique um, value render up, and then in the feature layer, I have a renderer property. I can pass that unique value render that I just created, where I set all that symbology, pass that, with, pass that into that renderer property within that feature layer constructor. And then once I add it, everything should show up like, it, like you just saw. All right. Okay, so we now have our layers, we have them rendered, but that's great until maybe you wanna get a little bit more information on a specific feature. And that's where interactivity comes into play. Um, you can do things working with pop-ups, you can uh, query your data, um, you can filter out your features based upon a specific definition expression. Uh, within our demos here, I just wanted to point out, um, we do have one filter features. I kept this in here because I think it's important and I know you guys can access this on my um, within the repo uh, just for purposes of time but we just can't get into all of it but um, this actually does show you how to work with the definition expression as well. I just kind of wanted to show you that so just as a future reference. So if we go ahead and take a look here talk a little bit about pop-ups Basically, it's just another widget. So we have this responsive widget that allows, it listens for a click event on your map, or actually on your view. Listens for that click event, um, and based upon what, you're, what feature you're clicking on, you can set it so that it will that it'll pass back within your pop-up widget whatever um, attribute information or whatever you want to have displayed. It is customizable. Um, we're not going to go into super detail on that. We actually had a making pop-ups session a couple days ago, Kelly and I did. So if anybody's interested in that, we're not doing it. We, there's no repeats tomorrow, but there is, um, all this stuff is recorded. So you guys should be able to get it within a couple months, hopefully, and you can go back in and listen on some of that. So let's go back in and talk a little bit more about the, the pop-ups. Um, so, the view has an associated pop-up, all right? The pop-up itself, the content, you're gonna wanna set that though within the pop-up template. That pop-up template is a property directly within your feature layer itself. You can do lots of different things within that. I'll show you in just a moment here. Um, but another cool thing that we added with 4 is that we have these dock options as well. So now you just don't have this pop-up just lingering about with on your screen when you click on something. You can actually dock it to the side or wherever you specify within your code. So let's go ahead. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. And with time's sake, I'm going to open up that demo. show you a pop-up. Okay, so I set a pop-up on the uh, 
the restaurant information. So what you'll see here, we've got Woody's Burgers. We have its address. We know when it's open. We can take a look at their website. So links are, um, you can work with links directly within the pop-up as well. And I'm also working with um, what we call media, media info. So I can bring in like an image, I could bring in a chart, um, whether like a bar chart, line chart, pie chart, you can pass that in here as well. Um, you can also work with attachments, you can have separate text. There's various elements that you can have, multiple elements that you can set within your pop-up at one time, which is actually a pretty cool thing within, um, if you were, ever worked with them in three, it was a little bit more difficult, it was a little bit more configuration. Um, it's much, much more easier and user-friendly now. So if we take a quick look at this source, you'll see here I have my pop-up template that I'm referencing. And we're gonna go down to where, all right, I create the actual template. So I am specifying, I was talking about how we have various types of elements that you can work with within your pop-up. Um, if you go to the help, I think it'd probably be easier if we see it from here. There is a content property. This content property can be various types of objects. You can work as a straight text, which if you've used it before, that might be what you might be accustomed to. You can set it as media, like I said, like an image or charts. You can specify field information. So what we were seeing earlier, just specific fields and their values. And also, if you have any attachments associated with that feature layer, those attachments will also automatically be brought over if you have, um, if you have that pop-up template enabled to work with that. So back to the source. We have our pop-up template, and we have our content property here. This content's actually kind of, I have, I have quite a bit of stuff in here. So we have an array of various objects that I'm working with. So I have, I'm working with my fields type, and I pass in the field info. So I wanna show visible, I wanna show the address, my hours, I, want, I have one with the website, a little bit of a description of what the restaurant's like. And I'm also showing another type of the media. All right, so in this case, I'm passing in my media info and I'm giving the source URL. I have an, um, a, a field within this layer that's image, this image underscore URL field that actually will pass in and um, reference um, a web accessible image. And then lastly, what we have here is we are setting, we're giving it all of the out fields, so it, needs to, it actually needs to be able to grab these fields from the feature layer, but we're setting the pop-up template that we just created earlier above, we're passing that into the pop-up template property of the, um, of the feature layer constructor. So I know there's a lot of information and there's, a, there, you know, I'm kind of speeding through some of this code here. Again, um, it's mainly just to kind of give you a high level and then, you know, if you really are interested in seeing how some of this stuff works, you can go back in, pull, pull download the demos. Um, when the recording's out, you can follow through and, you know, play to your heart's content. So let me see here. I think we may want to talk a little bit. Yeah, Kelly, you, I've talked enough about pop-ups. You can take over and do some now too. So I'm going to leave this slide up for just one. Actually, let me turn this back on. One other thing that you can add to the pop-up is we have these actions at the bottom. So the pop-up gives you the default action of a zoom action when you click on a feature. You can zoom to it. Well, you can add your own custom action. So you could run a geoprocessing task on the selected feature, or you can open up a website, or you can do a lot of other things with that action. And it's really easy at Forex to add it to an app. And I'm going to show you an example of this. Okay, so I have this, um, this map with trails in Washington on it. And we have this zoom to, which zooms you to that trail. In this case, we're looking at trail around Mount St. Helens. And we added another action to it. When I click on that action, it's gonna open up a new application. In this case, it's one of the templates from ArcGIS Online, um, showing the elevation profile for that selected template. So let's look really briefly at that source code. source. So 
So the source code we need to get that custom action <clears throat> is right here. So we're saying get the existing view pop-up actions and push a new action in. In this case, we're calling it elevation. We're specifying a class. This is a link to an icon font that displays that little elevation profile. And then we're listening to this trigger action. So whenever someone clicks on one of those actions, it fires this event. We're listening to it. And we're saying, hey, if it was the details event that happened, open up this new window with the URL that's available for the selected feature. So remember, there's a lot. You have the selected feature, so you can do a lot more with this. A lot of really cool stuff. One thing I also wanted to show you in this sample is we get some custom symbology. We get a custom pop-up. But if you look at the code, we don't have all of that code that Heather showed you that was really awesome and you had to type it all out. I mentioned earlier I'm lazy. It kind of makes me cry to think about like creating new symbols, creating a render, typing the pop-up template. I just lose patience. How many online portal users out here? ArcGIS Online portal? Yeah. So if you create a web map in ArcGIS Online, define your symbology there using the out-of-the-box tools, no code required, just click, click, click. Define your pop-up there, again, no code required. Save that web map. Take that web map ID and use it here to create a new web map instead of a new map. And you get all that stuff for free. You don't have to write code. You get the extent you saved your web map at. You get the symbology. You get the pop-up without writing all the code. So then you can save your energy for writing other code in your application, maybe that geoprocessing task that does something cool when you click on the link or some other tool that's specific to your organization. Can you, uh, we'll go back to the slides for a minute. Yeah, the last thing we're gonna talk about briefly is widgets. Um, in version 4X of the API, we are starting to add more and more widgets. We have a lot more than I have listed here. I think we're looking at print widget, some of the zoom controls, uh, base map toggle, and legend. The nice thing about the 4X widgets is they're working really hard to make them responsive. So if you build an app for desktop browser, it's still gonna look nice on a mobile browser, and the pop-up's a great example for that. If you size it down, you can dock it to the bottom of the screen. The pop-up's not gonna end up off the screen, part of it off the screen with just the little tail showing and people are trying to pan over. So it's a nice enhancement in the 4X widgets. Oh, I can't read this, let's see. Uh, view UI, okay, so view UI is also another really nice enhancement at 4.x. So the view UI gives us an easy way to add widgets to the corners of our application. So before, if we wanted to do this, it was possible you could create a div, you could position it absolutely on your page, you can add content to it and manage its position through CSS and HTML and a little bit of JavaScript. Well now, all you have to do is use this view.ui.add, give it your widget, and say which corner you want it to appear in, top left, bottom left, top right, bottom right. You can also move things and remove things. So move can be useful if you're building one of those apps that needs to be responsive. So you start out at a desktop. If they move down to a mobile browser, you might want to move the zoom controls to like the lower right corner so it's easier for people to access them with their thumb. And you can do it really easily with view.ui.move. Just move that zoom widget down to the bottom right corner. Can you go to the next? And the last thing I wanted to show you is expand, and we'll take a look at this. This was just added at 4.3. I think it's also really useful. What this gives us is the ability to easily show and hide some content behind a button. So you click on a button, and it opens a container with something displayed in it. In this case, we're displaying a base map gallery. And then they can also collapse to hide it. So again, we could do that before it's CSS, right? A little bit of HTML, a little bit of CSS to hide and show that container when somebody clicks on the button. But it's much nicer if you don't have to write that code. So let me switch over and show you an example of that. <clears throat> Actually, we'll look at the same demo. So here's the same demo app that we have in that repo. 
here's that expand widget. We click on it, it opens up the legend and shows it. We click it again and it closes it. So it's a really nice way of easily hiding content or saving screen real estate. Maybe you put a base map gallery there or some custom widget or content that you've created. And we'll look at the code required for that. <clears throat> So here's two bits of, of code that we're doing. The first is we're creating a new legend. The legend is a widget that you get out of the box. So we create a legend. We define the view that's associated with that legend, so this map view that we're looking at. And we specify which layers we want to show up in the legend. If you don't specify anything, all your layers will show up. Here we're specifying that we just want the restaurants to show up in the legend. Once we've created the legend, we create the new expand widget. We define an icon class that we want to show on our map. So that's what appears right here. There are a bunch of out of the box icon classes. I'll show you those really quickly. icon. You can find them in the help in this Esri icon font help topic. If you look down, you'll see a whole bunch of these images. Um, so if you wanted, for example, to have a pen for something, you could use esri-icon-authorize. You can look through here. There are a bunch of them available that you can just reference in your code. So that help topic title is, again, esri-icon-font. So here we're using one called esri-icon-layers. We list the name of the tooltip, so when we expand it, the tooltip that's going to appear when we hover, a title, and then the most important part is the content. In this case, we're putting an Esri widget there. Could be some DOM node, could be HTML that you want to display, it could be a string, whatever you want to have in that content container. And then all we do is add it to our view UI, like I showed you earlier. We just say view.ui.add the expand widget to the top left corner. So we can add it to the top left corner. And then I guess this app has 45 lines of code, so that's not that much. We have an app that has nicely symbolized layers. It has the expand widget, which shows our legends, nice pop-ups, the ability to zoom in and out. And like I mentioned earlier, these pop-ups are responsive. So if I were to open up the developer tools, pretend like I'm in a phone, dock that pop-up, and now we can see it's collapsed at the bottom and people can access the content in a really nice manner on the phone. Okay, we'll go back to the slides. <clears throat> Final slide is, well, yeah, we'll take any questions, but uh, while we're taking questions, we'll have the survey link up. So if you have time, please take the survey. We appreciate feedback. We wanna make this session better and work for you, so if it didn't, let us know. If it did, let us know that too. Um, also, for those of you hardcore guys that are just hanging around on Friday and you just didn't get enough, we're doing uh, tips, and tricks, tips, and tips and tricks for developing and debugging uh, JavaScript apps. That's a repeat session that we're having tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Um, we kind of go over a little bit of the things that we talked about, but more depth. So, working with your development environments, the de developer tools, um, what Kelly just showed you at the very end, where you opened up and emulate, and emulate what you're working with, we'll go into all of that. We'll also talk about some of the common gotchas. So if you're new to the JavaScript API, Heather will show some of the common things that we see all the time. So any GeoNet users out there? No. So we kind of looked at the common questions in GeoNet and the common questions that we get su from support and we put together a list of problems that people run into all the time. So you can um, come to learn how to not make those mistakes and also how to help other users on GeoNet. You can answer their questions, maybe become MVP, get a free ticket to the conference. They get iPads. Oh, iPad, that's even iPad. better. Yeah. An iPad, nice. I didn't get an iPad. So again, we apologize for the um, technical, there, it's, it's, I don't know, it's something that's happening in California, so we apologize. Thank you for being patient. Any questions? Yeah. What's the difference between a web app and a web map? Why would we use one or the other? Yeah, that's a good question. So a web app is, is in this way that we're referring to it here is an HTML application. So an application built with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that displays, in our examples, a web map. 
So a web map is sort of an RTS online term. It's a map that we're looking at in a web application of some sort, which might be ArcGIS Online, might be Web App Builder, might be a configurable application from ArcGIS Online, or a custom HTML, CSS, and JavaScript application. So when we refer to the map, we're basically just referring to the map and its contents, the actual visual map. The web app is everything else around it, like the widgets, or if you have a form, or title, or header, all of that becomes our app. Do you want to take the SAS stuff? I can do the yeah, so, um, you know, I think SAS is awesome. SAS is great if you're building an application with a lot of CSS and you want to take advantage of things like variables or working with some properties that maybe are referenced in different ways on different browsers. SAS hides all that and compiles it and gives you this CSS. So I, I, I guess that probably made it more confusing. I think my short answer would be, if you're new to the world of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, learn HTML, JavaScript, and vanilla CSS first. When you start to feel comfortable in CSS and things about it start to annoy you, like the fact that you can't have a variable and you have to declare a color in multiple places throughout your app, or you have to type out all these extra properties. So there's gonna be some day when you're feeling comfortable in CSS and you're like, wow, this is really annoying and I feel like this is really clunky. That's kind of the point where you know that you might wanna start investigating SAS. But I, I'd say until you feel like some comfort level with it that I probably wouldn't, um, wouldn't mess with it. But that's just my opinion. Somebody else may tell you that you wanna learn it from the get-go. The, the TypeScript, um, the TypeScript stuff, Really, all do you, what? What background did you come from? Do you, are you coming brand, brand new? Did you have? I mean, were you like, you know? So I'm, I'm a GIS analyst. Okay. GIS. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we were as well. So, um, I worked. I started off. I did. Good lord, arc objects, and then moved over to Flex. So, I mean, it was. I came into the world of JavaScript, and I was like, ah, this is crazy. It's like the wild, wild west in here. You, you're not declaring like everything. You can have anything set to anything. Um, and I think that's where, at least for me, I think that's where TypeScript kind of helps because it, it gives you that strict typing. Um, it, it's just like they said, you hear this term. It's a superset of JavaScript. It basically just means you can write your TypeScript out. You can compile that TypeScript, and then it just creates this JavaScript under the hood. Um, for what you're doing, and Brandon, just if you're just starting out, there's there's no need to go in and start learning that. Um, if it's something that you're interested in, sure. But for right now, I mean, even just with our documentation, we just started showing TypeScript stuff, um, mainly because our custom widget framework that we just implemented with 4.2, um, that's, we're, you don't have to, but we're basically pushing people more towards working and creating them using TypeScript. It just makes things a little bit easier. Um, we do provide the definition, um, the TypeScript, di TypeScript definition files. Basically, you would just import that, um, but you'd have to have some utilities installed on your machine in order to, to go through all that. So. I don't know if that made you, that was more confusing or not. And, uh, just to make it short, probably I would say, you know, again, like Kelly said, when you get to that point, you know, maybe you might want to start investigating it. But um, for what you're probably just starting off doing, it may not be absolutely necessary. So, um, the IDE, I think he's talking about like in Visual that. Studio Code. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think that you get full code assist like you might be used to if you're used to something like C sharp. But if what you do in get, you do. If you work with TypeScript, you do. Yeah. So that might be a reason to go to TypeScript. Yeah. And Dojo TypeScript libraries are available, and ours are. But if you're just working with JavaScript, you don't. But what you do get in Visual Studio Code um, is something I call. Um, I don't know, code hinting or intelligent hinting. So if I, let's see, open 
an app that we just created. You do, it does become smarter about what's in your app as you type and you do get some IntelliSense. So if I type view, it knows already that I have this local variable. If you can see the bottom option, it says local variable. So I can just hit tab and it knows about that local variable. So it learns about the variables and it learns about the classes in your app. So it makes it easier to type and you make less typos. But that's not code assist where you can see the input arguments. For that, I guess Heather was saying you'd have to work with type script. And we have information in the API about getting started with TypeScript. Yeah. Oh, that was that from was the old Aptana. a long time ago yeah. with Aptana. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was available with Aptana. Um, that would be, the, the closest thing would be to use the TypeScript definition files um, and work off TypeScript. Um, and again, it, it's really just what your comfort level is. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no magic button that's like, you know, you're moving over from, you know, maybe if you're familiar with a .NET, you know, C Sharp environment and everything. It's just a little bit. It's, it's, it is a little bit of a change in, in thinking. At least I know it was for me. You get used to it, though, really, after a while. You get used to just having the API reference open and working with it, but that's not a great answer. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, so with the, with, if you publish it with your service, like Heather showed the example earlier of the layer that had that nice default rendering applied, that's a great solution too. What the web map will give you is pop-up. You can predefine the pop-up information and the extent. But if you already have something that works for you with the saving the layer symbology with the service, yeah, that's perfectly fine as well. And Heather showed an example of that. I think it was in the first, yeah, second layer yeah, demo. Yeah, it was that activities. It was kind of quick, but... Yeah, that if you if you publish it out with it, it'll just carry that over as well. You don't have to go and monkey with anything. Yeah. So again, it, it really just depends on what you have within your organization, what your needs are, right? I mean, if you already have that that workflow set up and it works for you, then you know that might be something that you know why why go in and recreate anything if it's if it's there already. Well, especially if somebody took the time to create nice default symbology, but we see a lot of like the ArcGIS online hosted services where it'll just be that red dot, right? If you guys seen maps that just have that default little red dot, it doesn't look so great. So if that's what you're looking at, you probably want to spend some time and make some nicer symbology. Questions? Well, thank, thank you, you guys. Yeah. Especially thank for coming right before the so party. Late. <laughs>